You know, sometimes in the path of life, you'll meet someone and they have, end up having this remarkable impact and influence on you, and particularly in your walk with Jesus Christ. And it's my privilege today to get to, in just a moment, introduce to you uh, Pastor Scott Rideout, who is one of those people in my life. Uh, he has been my mentor and coach for the last seven years. I met him as a part of movement, a movement of churches that I was a part of called Converge, which is dedicated to starting and strengthening churches. And the first time I met Scott and heard him speak, I just came away from that meeting thinking, I need more of what he has in his life, in my life, as a follower of Jesus Christ, and as a pastor, and as a leader. And the Lord has literally used him to uh, encourage pastors all around the world, literally thousands. Uh, he has a heart for Jesus and a heart for reaching the lost. He's currently a part of a movement of churches that's called the Timothy Initiative, where they are starting church plants in some of the least reached, hardest reached areas of the world to reach people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I hope he'll share a little bit more with you about that in just a few moments. Uh, I would tell you that there hasn't been a major decision in my life or in uh, uh, my church leadership that I haven't somehow sought his counsel uh, somewhere along the way. And so, and he has just spent about two and a half days with our church leadership as we're discerning, uh, beginning this process of discerning God's direction for us in the future. And so uh, it is uh, my privilege to introduce you today, my friend and coach, uh, Pastor Scott Wright. I want you to let him come on up here today. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you today. I wish John would just stay up here and say some more nice things. Um, <laughs> You know, it, it is a, it seriously is a, honestly, it was a privilege to be with the elders and some, some of the staff here and encounter. I, I hope you know what a great leadership team you have here and how much they love the Lord and how much they love you. You know, there's three qualifications for a great pastor. They love God, they love God's word, and they love the congregation they serve. And John's a great pastor uh, because he loves all those things. And again, I hope you know what a gift that John and Amy and their family are to you, and I'm looking forward to talking and walking through God's Word with you today. Before I get there, I want to tell you a story. Uh, a few years ago, my wife Lisa and I were in Banff, Canada. Anyone ever been to Banff? Uh, spectacular, unbelievable. The mountains just kind of rise up, and it's an incredible place. We went to a place called Lake Louise. I was speaking at a conference. The conference was over, and so we started walking around Lake Louise, and it's just this crystal blue water, kind of like Tahoe, except, you know, north of there. And it was, it was great. We, we were walking around. We got to the backside. There were some mountain climbers up on the cliff, and they were, they were freehanding. They were, they were, it's unbelievable to watch that kind of stuff, and my wife and I were excited. But then I, but then I saw a path. I saw a path going up, and I just knew that this went up to the source of where all the water was coming from, perhaps a glacier or something like that. And my wife and I had this language. We just kind of look at each other. And I looked at her, and she looked at me. And, and my wife likes to hike, but I like to hike, you know. And she's like, go ahead. And so I take off up the path, and I'm going through, and it's June 1st. It's the very first day the, the, the path is open. But I get to this place where there's no more path. All there is is snow. But it's not going to stop me, right? Because I'm an adventurer. So I, I start trudging through the snow and I, and I get up to the, to the top where there's, a, there's this beautiful field and there's a river running through it and, and it's surrounded, 360 panorama mountain view. And I'm just, I'm looking back down and I see the valley, I see the lake down below. And, and I got to be honest with you, I'm having this moment with God. I'm like, thank you, God. Wow. What you create is just so amazing and so powerful. And I'm just taking it all in. And, and me and God are talking. And then these two other hikers come up and it kind of ruins the moment. But, you know, because I, I thought God made this for me. But, you know, but, but I'm up there for a little bit and just enjoying it, listening to the birds and the, and the animals and, you know, listening to the creek. And it's just, it's just, it's just great. But 
I'm on a time frame because my wife allows me to play, but only till dinner's ready, you know. So, so I'm up there in that moment and having this great time with God, but now I've got to get down to the mountain and it's going to take a little while. So I, I'm walking down to the path and I get to this place where there's a, there's a fork in the road and I didn't realize coming up, I went up so fast, that there was a fork in the road and I wasn't sure which way to go. And so I'm looking at the fork and I'm thinking, well, I'm a smart guy. You know, because one goes up and the other one goes down and logic says you're supposed to go down. That's the easy path, right? So I I, I start going down that path. I get about a mile down that path and I get to the creek and I jump across the creek and I realize I'm not on the right path. I have gone the wrong way and now I'm going to be late getting getting back to to my wife. And I thought, well, maybe not because I could take a shortcut. I, I could just take a shortcut and go through the woods and the path's got to be up there somewhere. And so I jump, you know, jump across the creek and I'm walking through the woods and, and the snow is getting deeper and the woods are getting thicker. And then I think to myself, Scott, you're an idiot. <laughs> there are bears and wolves and lynx in these, and they're looking for dinner right now and you seem to be it. You need to backtrack and take the right path. And so I backtrack, but now I got to go up the hill. The sun is going down. The snow is turning to ice. I've got tennis shoes on. Not very smart, but I I make it back up to the, the fork in the road and I take the other one and I'm over an hour late. And my, my, the, the mountain climbers are no longer there. My wife is sitting there going, and I say, hi. (laughs) And she says, what? what happened? And I, and I tell her what happened, and I took the wrong road. And my wife is so understanding. She did increase our life insurance consist, you know, significantly, but, but, she, but she understood, you know, that's her husband. And, you know, the reason I tell that story is the conversation today is, is this. Listen, the path that you take matters. The path that you take matters. Hey, meet me in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Matthew 7, verse 13, we're in, in near the end of the Sermon on the Mount and over the first couple of chapters in chapters 5 and chapters 6, Jesus has given the best sermon ever given. And the first part of it, he talks about what, what catches God's eye. What are the things that, that turn his, his, his heart? And then he goes into this, hey, be careful of religious leaders because the level of righteousness they strive for is, is not God's level. That you, if you just match the righteousness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, it's, it's, not, it's not enough. It's not what God wants from you. And then go to chapter 6 and he says, hey, be real careful about your spiritual practices because, listen, your, your motives matter. And if you're being spiritual just to be seen by people, that's your whole reward. But God has a, a higher level for you uh, there. And then you get into chapter 7 and, and it starts talking about how we, we have to be careful how we judge other people because by the standard we use, we measure to us in return. And finally, verse 12 of chapter 7 gets us to the place. Listen, there's a, there's a golden rule. There's, if you remember this, you'll, you'll do pretty, pretty well. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And, and this is the point in the sermon where everything changes. We're, we're going from discussion to decision. We're, we're going for, from uh, what, we, what we talk about with, with people and how we live with people to how we actually follow, f- follow God. And this is, this is kind of the centerpiece in literary terms. It's the centerpiece of the sermon. It's the apex of the address. It's the, it's the summit of the sermon on the, on the mount because from here you look back and this is the discussion about people and, and now we're going to talk about what does it mean to follow follow God. And so we, there's, a, there's a choice being made here. There's a wise decision. There's a first step that he says to take. So let's pick it up in chapter 7, verse 13. And Jesus says this, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. There are four comparisons. There's two gates and two roads and two groups of people and two destinations. And really, it's an extreme. Because if you look, it's a wide gate and a small gate, a broad road and a narrow road, a road that leads to life and a road that leads to destruction. There are many that go one way and few that find the other, other way. And what you see here is that everything from this point on is like Noah. Everything's in twos. 
I mean, there's, there's, there's two kinds of prophets and there's two types of trees and two types of fruit and two types of people and two types of builders and two houses and two foundations and two results. And what we're seeing happening in the sermon at this point in time, listen, we, we've talked a lot. Now it's time to decide. Now, now we've got to make a, a choice. Are we in or are we out? Is it yes or no, black or white, with God or against God? There's only two choices to make. And this is not the first time that the people of God have been asked to make a choice. We can go all the way back to the Old Testament to the time of Moses. Remember, he, thinks, he rescues the people out of Egypt and they get to the edge of the promised land and they send spies into the land to check out the land and they, they go in there and surely enough, it is full of fruit. It's full of milk and honey. It's a great place to, to be and they, and they come back and tell the people, yep, everything God said was going to be there. He's providing. He's, he's got it. But there's also giants in the land. The Nephilim are there, and, and, and we're like grasshoppers in their sight, and, and we honestly feel like grasshoppers in our own sight, and, and 10 of the 12 spies say, we, we, we shouldn't go there. And Joshua, Caleb are the other spies, and they're like, no, 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 God has given us this. He's promised us this. We can trust God. But as you know, in most of life, the Israelites are like us because the majority is always right. And they believe the 10 spies and they don't, they don't go into the land. And the result is they don't, expi- they don't experience the blessing of God. And it said that generation wanders around in circles for 40 years. And the older generation that won't believe God dies out. And there's a younger generation that hopefully will follow God. And 40 years later, Moses is still alive. He's still leading. And he has this conversation with the people of God. And says, listen, chapter 30 of Deuteronomy Verse 15, he says this, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. Doesn't that sound like the narrow road conversation in Matthew 7? Life and prosperity, death and destruction. You have to make a decision of who you're going to follow and what you're going to believe. And then he, he dies and then Joshua becomes the leader of the people of God and he takes them into the promised land and they, they somewhat obey God, which I'm not sure that you can really do, but they somewhat obey God. And Joshua gets to the end of his life and he's given a conversation in chapter 24 of Joshua, verse 15. And you probably have this on a pillow, or if you're from California, you might have it on a tattoo. You, you tattoo in California, right? You know, okay. Yeah, so you, you, you've got this, this thing, and it says this, Choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. They're asked to make a, a, a choice, but that's not the last one. Over and over it happens, but let's jump forward to Elijah, the prophet of God, and, and he is uh, in First Kings chapter 18. He's got this, this battle royale going on. It's the 850 prophets that are against God, the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah, uh, Queen Jezebel's side of things, uh, Ahab's side of things, they're, they're over here and there's just, there, there's just Elijah by himself. All he's got is God. And by the way, uh, God plus just one person is always a majority. So he's, he's got God and he challenges them and then he says, listen, I'll show you. And this is what he says to the people. He says, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. And if Baal is God, follow him. Yes or no, either or, black or white, in or out, with me or against me. He says you've, you, there are absolutes. You've got, to make a, you've got to make a choice here. But can we be honest? We don't like absolutes, do we? We like options. We love options. That's why we like Cheesecake Factory. Because you got 27 pages with 15 options on each page. You could have something different every single day of the year. We, we love that. You get the menu and it's like, what should I get? It doesn't matter. It's all bad for you. But you can, you can just, you can have whatever you want. We, we love that. That's why we love Amazon. Because you go into a store and you're like, which one do you want? Do you want the black one or the black one, you know, but you go to Amazon, you got a thousand different choices and they can deliver today. And it's, it's just amazing. We love that kind of stuff. We, we love those kind of 
of choices. That's why we like California. You could have, where else can you have beach and mountains? I mean, where else can you, you can go down to LA and do all that, that nightlife kind of stuff, or you can, you can go up north to the Central Valley and just enjoy nature. You can go up to Sequoia or Yosemite or up to Tahoe, and you can get up there in the, in the redwoods, and it's amazing. You can go down to the beach in San Diego. You can, you can go in the desert of Bob. You don't want to, you don't want to do that. But you've got all these different options. We, that's why we love it. That's why we love Netflix. Because you get a movie theater and you can have, you know, three or four movies and only one of them is really good. But Netflix has thousands of choices. Now, it's not enough. That's why we have Hulu and Prime Video and all that sort of stuff. But, <laughs> but, but you know what I'm talking about, right? You, I mean, you, you, we love options. We hate ultimatums. We, because we like to believe that we're actually in control in this life. So, so when it comes to the life to come, we also want to feel like we're in control of that. And so we think to ourselves, well, lots of options in this life. There must be options for, for the next life. So what do we start doing? We start trying to find our own truth, speak our own truth, live our own truth, like truth is something that comes from us. It's, it, it doesn't. It's, it's absolute. We, we, we look and we like, okay, I, I can set my own agenda. I can find my own way. I can, I can find my own path because all paths lead to God. That's false, by the way. I just make sure this church knows that. Right? That's, that's false. But we, we have all these things and we think, well, I can just, I, listen, everyone makes mistakes in this life and whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And, you know, everyone makes mistakes and we can do that. I, I can probably, in the life to come, I can call a mulligan. I can phone a friend. I can get a get out of jail free card, right? I mean, that's the way that it works, isn't it? But what if we're wrong? What if there really is only two choices and, and one leads to life and one leads to destruction? What if the stakes are higher than we ever imagined and the decisions we make are irreversible and the consequences are irrevocable and you're thinking, I'm so glad John brought this guy in. He's such a happy guy. <laughs> you know, we, we look at this passage and Jesus is saying, listen, it's, it's, it's right or wrong. It's in or out. It's black or white. It's with me or against me. And it's absolute. And, and he talks about this road. He talks about this path. The, the path theme is all through Scripture. You see it everywhere. We're always on a, on a path. And there's this thing called the principle of the path. Uh, Andy Stanley talked about it in one of his books. But let me just give you some of the ideas of the principle of the path. If you're taking notes, take this because this is going to be very practical for you. Principle of the path, part number one is this. Everyone is on a path. Everyone is on a path. We like to think that life is random, that life is disconnected. We can do whatever we want over here because it doesn't actually affect anything over there, but we find that life is absolutely connected. If you're a, if you're a teenager or have raised teenagers, uh, this you'll understand because there's always a point in your teenage life where something happens. There's a family meeting and mom and dad sit down with you and say, son, daughter, we love you. We're so proud of you in so many ways, but lately you have been making some decisions that concern us. And then the parent says this, I have been down that, what? I've been down that road. You do not want to go down that road. I know where this path leads. It's not where you want to go. Why? Because we all know that life is not random. Life is a path. And not only do these things, are they, are they uh, in, in order, they're, they're cumulative at times. Which brings us to the second part of the path. It's this decisions determine directions. Your decisions you're making today, not the giant ones, just even the small ones, they matter. Because decisions are like steps, and as you take steps, you go in a direction. And you, you keep making steps and steps and steps and our decisions determine our, our direction. And let me give you an example of this. No one wakes up one morning and says, I think I'll make a decision today that will ruin my marriage forever. But it happens. You know, a few months ago, maybe there was uh, someone, some new person in the office and you're like, they're an intriguing person. You, you start to get to know a little bit. Wow, they're fascinating. And then, and you find your affections start going that way. But you're actually married 
And you're like, well, I, I don't really want to say anything because I can handle this, and, but I just need to let you know you're as sick as your secrets, all right? So, but, you, but you don't say anything and you keep taking steps, taking steps, and next thing you know, you've, you've cheated. You didn't plan to. You didn't want to, but, but you did. And you're like, what, what happened? How did I get here? But you're trying to be honest. You go back to your spouse and you say, I don't know what happens. And he or she says, are you kidding me? Don't you see the path? One decision after another, after another. Could, couldn't you see that? F financially, no, no one wakes up in the morning and says, I think I'll make decisions today that will ruin my financial life for the next 20 years. But it happens. You see, you go into college and your parents give you the credit card. Wow. And they tell you only for emergencies. But honestly, that pizza on Thursday night looks like an emergency to you. And you spend the money on the pizza and then you, the shoes are an emergency and the trip is an emergency and that, that date is an emergency and you, you, you max out the card. You're like, oh no, but the good news is there's lots of people out there that will give you another card. And so you've got a second credit card that your parents don't know about and you max that one out. But now you've met this other person and you got, you're thinking about getting married and, but, but she did it and you did it. And now you're bringing all this debt in along with the student debt, which never goes away no matter what vote is going. And so it just, it just, it just goes, oh, on and on and on and, and you're like how did we get here and the parents are like didn't you see it every decision you make every move you make every path you take watching you thank you sting you know so it's it's happening it's happening you know it's 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 a decision part number three is this direction not intention determines destination direction not intention determines destination we love to lean into our intentions. We want people to think great of us because of our intentions. I really meant to call. I meant to give you a present. I meant to show up and help you on moving day. I, I, I want credit for my intentions. But good intentions are no good. Good intentions don't actually lead to good actions. It's not our intentions, but what has our attention that matters. Because intention is about thoughts and attention is about actions. So what has our attention matters? Listen, maybe after, after service today, I, I plan to go up to Santa Barbara. I, I want to go by the beach and just enjoy up there. I have friends who, who live up there. But if, but if I, have, and I have every intention to go in there, but if I take 101 South, For the directionally challenged in the room, <laughs> Santa Barbara is not 101 South, it's 101 North, all right? All right, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to end up in Santa Barbara, I'm going to be in Burbank. That, that's not Santa Barbara. I, mean, I could have every intention of, of going to San Diego and I get on I-5 North. I'm not going to San Diego. I'm going to Stockton. <laughs> Again, lovely place. By the way, if you're offended by anything I say, my email is john at encounter.org. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, you know it, it, it's not about intention. It's about attention. It's about action. And so just know, this is the first three parts of the path, uh, principle of the path. I'll give you the fourth one in just, in just a little bit. Let's apply this to, to God's word. Let's apply this to Matthew chapter 17. Just, just know that there, Matthew, sorry, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Just, just know this, that there are, there are two paths. There's a wide path and a narrow path. A wide road and a, and a narrow road. The wide road is the road of the world. It's the way of the world. It's the way the world thinks. It's the way the world acts. It's the way the world prioritizes things. I wrote down some comments. Uh, maybe you've heard these before. These are wide road kind of thinking. It's, it's things like this. You can have it all. Just go with the flow. Everybody's doing it. You need to look out for number one. All those are wide road comments. Listen, uh, instant gratification is is our focus. If it feels good, do it. Go with your heart. They're, they're all the ways of the world. They're all that path. Now, it feels good, do it. How many of you remember from the 1970s, they had bumper stickers on cars, and one of them was, if it feels good, do it. Does anyone remember that bumper sticker? Yeah, if it feels good, do it. So I was a teenager uh, soon after that time, and people had that bumper sticker, and I had a plan. 
I had, I had a plan. I knew what I was going to do. If I ever found a car with a head, if it feels good, do it on the bumper or the back of the car. I was going to get right behind it. I was going to hit the gas pedal and go, boom! <laughs> and the driver would get out of the car and come back to my car. He's like, what were you thinking? I'm like, I was just taking your advice. That felt awesome, you know? <laughs> it's terrible advice. But we think that it's the right thing to, to do. The, the thing about the, the wide road is it does this. It overpromises and underdelivers. See, the wide road is like a, like a ladder. You're climbing up the ladder of success and you've defined success in your mind. This is what success is. This is what success does. And I just, I just want to be successful. And success is that person. The sec- success is that office. Success is fame or fortune. Success is sex. Success is all these other things. And you, and you climb the wall. You climb the ladder and only to realize as you get to the top, is, is that it? That, that wasn't the full life I thought I'd have. And you realize that your ladder is leaning against the wrong wall because you pursued something that God never meant you for you to pursue or to define your life from. Uh, there's a pastor in Florida. His name is Joby Martin. He's in Jacksonville. He tells a story about in Jacksonville, they still have dog races. And uh, they would have the dog track. And he's like, I need to go see this. I just want to see what the, what, what the hubbub is about. And so he, go, he goes to the track. And again, if you don't like that, I'm not condoning it. But my, again, my email, John at Encounter. So, um, but they, they, he's at the track and, and it's electric. I mean, there's a lot of things going on there. And the, he looks down at the track. It's bigger than he thought. And there's these dogs. Uh, they're over here. They're, they're in, playing with each other. They're kind of squirrely running around. And all of a sudden, the announcer says, here's Rusty. And Rusty is this mechanical arm with what looks like a rabbit on the end of it. It got fur on top of this mechanical arm and, and the dogs see it. They're like, it's a rabbit, it's a rabbit. And they're so excited about the rabbit and the gate goes down. The dogs take off, but so does the, so does the rabbit. And the rabbit goes all around the track and they've almost got it, almost got it. And then the rabbit disappears. And the dogs are like, oh, 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 oh. you know, they're just, where's the rabbit going? And they, and they talk to each other all week long. I gotta have the rabbit. The, if I have the rabbit, my life will be complete. It'll be great. And then the next day they go out and guess what? Here's Rusty. And Rusty comes out and they chase the rabbit the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. And day after day and week after week and month after month, they chase the rabbit. And it's, oh, it's, it's if I just had the rabbit. Sometimes they actually catch the rabbit because the mechanical arm breaks. And, and they catch the rabbit, and it's, it's just fur on metal. And they say that once a dog catches the rabbit, they never run the race again well. Here, here's, the, here's the question. What's your rabbit? What, what's the thing you're chasing that's not God? That you think, if I just had a bigger home, if I just had a nicer car, if I just had a better job, if I just had a better family, if I had a bigger house, if I had a bigger wife, if I had bigger kids, it'd be better, you know? That was a joke. (laughs) What's the thing you're chasing? You're like, okay, my life will be better if I have this thing, this position, these resources. Because the wide road always overpromises and and under delivers. God designed you for him and experience fullness of life in him and not in stuff that he creates. So that's why we look at the narrow road. Jesus the road, Jesus road is the narrow road. It's different. Yeah, we, we kind of like all these things. It's one thing to like it, but it's another thing to love it and to pursue it. But Jesus says, no, no, there's a different way of life. And, and what I would say about the narrow road is, listen, it's counterintuitive because it says, few find it. It means not everyone's on this road. Very few people actually take this road. You're in the minority if you're taking the narrow road of following Jesus with your life. It's counterintuitive. It's also counter, uh, it's countercultural. It's also counterintuitive, which means it doesn't always make sense. Have you ever noticed there's a whole lot of things in the Bible that don't make sense? I mean, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for 40 years and I'm trying to figure out how to walk with Jesus and there's always things in there that through my life that I've said, okay, I'm not sure that feels right. I'm not sure I'd really want to go that way. See, it's not the things in the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's sometimes it's the things I do understand and I just don't want to do it. But here's, here's what I found over 40 years of walking with, with God. There's, there's one God and I'm not him. And when I, and when I, when I try to, 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 to follow him, like my feelings aren't going that direction, but my, my faith goes in that direction. I choose to believe him. You know what I figure out after a while? It's counterintuitive and it's countercultural, but it's just right on. 
God is right every time. He's right every time. He's the one I need to follow with, with my life. And it, it, it's counterintuitive. Think about the things in, in the Sermon on the Mount that, that say, hey, listen, pray for your enemies. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In other words, endure persecution. He, he talks about, hey, listen, if someone forces you to go one mile, go with them a second mile. <laughs> he tells us to forgive the unforgivable. He, he tells us if someone takes your jacket, give them your shirt as well. All that's just counterintuitive. And, and then outside of the Sermon on the Mount, he says stuff like this, to, to, to live you must die, to gain you must lose, to be first you got to be last. And it's like, it's all counterintuitive. See, the problem is that the Bible is, is, is the difference between, the, there's a difference between the Bible being unclear and being unpopular. It's clear. It's just unpopular with others and with us. And we have to choose to trust God. We have to choose to follow him. Listen, you cannot follow God with conditions. He's either God of all things or not God at all. We're either in or out. It's yes or no. It's with me or against me. I, I, I told you, I think John told you, I work for an organization that starts new churches around the world in places where it's illegal to be Christian, where you're, you're persecuted or put in jail if you, if you convert, um, where you can't have churches. And we, we do a lot of that. I can't even say what countries we're in, but I, I have leaders around the world that I get to, to the privilege of spending time with, and they just have a different mentality. I was in one meeting, and my friend looked at me and said, see those guys over there? There's six, six leaders from a certain country over here. I said, yeah. He said, they've been in jail about 30 times for their faith. I had a friend who a few weeks ago led his neighbor to Christ and the, they live in an apartment and the apartment owner kicked them out of the apartment because they converted somebody. I have a friend who was in jail for five years for sharing his faith. Now he didn't actually serve the whole five years because he went into jail and he started sharing his faith and everyone was coming to Christ in the jail. So they kicked him out of the jail, you know? So... You can't stop it. You can't stop it if it's part of you. But, but wouldn't it be great if we believed that God was worth not just dying for, but worth living for? And we would, we would face the, the challenges of life because we know that God is, is worth it. See, there's a, there's, a, there's a thing that we have. Listen, it just seems like it's easier. But look at Proverbs 14, verse 12. It says this, There's a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. How we live today should be determined by what we believe about tomorrow. And my friends in these countries, they believe that the Bible is true and that God is good and he'll keep his promises. And Jesus said in John 16, 33, he says, in this world you'll have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. I want to show you one verse. It's in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that, that kind of pictures this whole thing. I want you, to, I want you to see this. Romans 6, 23 says this, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What we have is this, this picture on the right side. I'm going to give you three words, uh, wages and sin and death. And what you see is, let me give you definitions. Wages are what we earn or deserve for the work that we've done. Sin is actually an archery term. It's when you shoot an arrow and it misses the, the bullseye. They take a measuring rod and they measure from the perfect center to where you hit. And sin means, to, it's, it means missing the perfect mark. That's all it means. Now let me ask you, how many of us have missed God's perfect mark for our lives? If you didn't raise your hand, you just lied. You just missed the mark. All right, so we just, we've, we've all done it. We're all sinners who need a savior, right? We need someone to, to help us. The, the wages of sin is, it says death. Death is not just the physical death we all experience, but it literally means in the Bible, separation from God. So what we earn or deserve by missing God's perfect mark is separation from him. And all of us have sinned, it says in Romans. All have sinned and falling short of the glory of God. That's the bad news, but there's a but in the middle of the verse. So there's good news on the other side. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so on the other side, over here, we've got this, this, these different words, gift and God and eternal life, and they're comparisons. It's not a wage, it's a gift. A wage is what we earn. A gift is, 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 is free. And the difference between sin and, and God is sin is missing God's perfect mark, but God is, God is perfect and God's love is perfect. Listen, I don't know what you came here to hear today, but let me just say this. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been, 
what's been done to you, how deep the hole is you've dug, how long you've been away. God loves you. He loves you. And he wants you to have relationship with him. He's not, he's not just mad at you. He's mad about you. And that's the story of, the, of this verse because we're, we're trying very hard to move from the one side to the other side from our, our wages of sin is death to the gift of God is eternal life. And a lot of us say, well, I, I want eternal life, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work really hard. But do hard workers sin? Yeah. What do they deserve? Separation. How about religious people? Do religious people sin? Some of you in the church long enough say, oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> What do they deserve? They deserve separation. But, but the verse hasn't ended because it says, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so what we have now is the, the cross of Christ in the middle. That Jesus changes everything. And it's like, we got a paycheck over here. The wages of sin is death. So I get a paycheck that says, says uh, to Scott, it says, it says death. Signed, holy God. But, but, but Jesus also got a paycheck because he came to the earth. He lived a perfect life. He obeyed God in everything. He didn't sin at all. So he got a paycheck too. It says to, uh, it says to Jesus, eternal life, signed loving father. And imagine you and Jesus are talking to each other and he's like, what'd you get? He said, I, I, got, I got death. Hey, what'd you get? I got, I got life. And he looks at you and says, do you want to switch paychecks? What? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take yours. If you want mine, you just have to believe that we can, we can do this. And he, and he takes your check and, you, and he, he, what does he do? He, he dies on the cross for you and me. He pays the penalty. He pays he, what, what you earn or deserve for being separate. It's, it's what you earn or deserve for not being right is, or missing God's perfect mark is, is death. And Jesus died. But he also rose to show he, to show he had the authority to forgive our sin. And so now we have the opportunity to have life because of Jesus. Here's the question. What are you trusting in for eternal life? Is it being good? Is it being better than most? Comparing yourself? Is it being religious? Because none of the things work. The only thing that works is Jesus. So here's the difference. Over, over here on the sin side, we, over here it's, it's about achieving, but on this side it's about believing and receiving. On this side it's about trying. On this side it's about trusting. On this side it's about religion. On this side it's about relationship. On this side it's about what we do, but on this side it's what Christ has done and just what he's done. You have been forgiven for your past. You have power for your present. You have hope for your future because of what Jesus has done in your life. What are you trusting in? What are you trusting in? Listen, the, the part four of the principle of the path is you can change your path. You can change your path. Actually, it's Jesus who changes your path. You just got to stop trying and start trusting. Stop trying to achieve and start to believe and receive. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. In John chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus says, I am the gate. In John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, I'm the path, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Peter talks about it in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, and he, he says, is there salvation in no one else? Talking about Jesus, there's no other name under heaven given among people by which we must be saved. 1 John 5 verse 11 says this, the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life and that life is in his son. And he who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son does not have life. You can change your path. You just got to stop trying on your own and start trusting what Jesus has done. Stop trying to achieve the perfect life and start to believe that what Jesus did on the cross for you was enough. And some of you have been believers for a long time and you know, you know that, that you're, you're taking steps, you're making decisions and Jesus is back that way and you've got to say, no, 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 I'm going to turn around. By the way, the word in the Bible for turning around, repent. It means a change of mind and a change of direction and we're just going to go a different way. So I would ask you, are there any decisions, if you're a believer, any decisions that you're making right now that just need to know it's a path? Turn around, repent of those things. And if you're not a believer, if you never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, can you think of any good reason why you wouldn't want to do that today? He's waiting for you. He's waiting for me. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, you are good. You've given us everything we need. 
And yet we still are convinced that the wide path is better just because everyone takes it. But there's a narrow road. There's a way that seems right, but in the end it leads to death. There's a way that seems logical, but <laughs> our faith is countercultural. It's counterintuitive. And so, uh, Jesus, just for those who are believers, I just ask that you would put on their hearts, just tell them what, what it is they need, to, they need to surrender to you. And for those who are, are still on the journey, I just pray that they would recognize that we, we just, none of us can do it. None of us can do it. And so they would say, Jesus, I realize I've been trying real hard, but I don't have to. I can just trust. Trust that what you did on the cross was sufficient for me. I ask you to be my Savior, my Lord, to forgive my sin, to come into my life, and to lead me every step of the way. And I know I'll make mistakes, but Lord, my, my commitment is I, I'm going to learn how to trust you. Day by day, decision by decision, I'm going to stop chasing the rabbit. I'm going to chase after you. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Encounter, great to be with you. God bless you. Thank you so much.